Good morning, everyone. Good morning, formally. Many of you already said good morning, too, but I want to say it formally to those watching on Channel 95. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will and be glad in it. I said every Sunday, rejoicing is a choice. We choose to rejoice despite our circumstances. I know that all of us aren't in perfect health, those watching on TV and those here today, but God is still good. While our body changes, our mind changes, sometimes our heart changes, but God doesn't change. He stays the same. He's the same God from the past. He's the same God today as yesterday, and he'll be the same God tomorrow, the God that loves us, the God that graces us, and the God that's there even in our darkest circumstances. God is faithful. Do you believe that this morning, that God is faithful? He's faithful. I just want to remind somebody today that God is faithful. So if you're going through something today, I want you to say it with me. That is what? God is faithful. All right. We are starting a new series simply titled The Gospel of John. The way, the truth, and the light. And in this series, over the next couple of weeks, we'll be going through the book of John and studying what John has penned on paper as he was inspired, of course, by the Holy Spirit to the church today. John has so much to say about Jesus that I believe will help us better understand why Jesus is truly the Son of God and who Jesus truly is. The Gospel of John was penned by the age apostle in about around the time of 85 A.D., for those of you that don't understand who or what A.D. is after the death of Christ. By the time this book was actually written, much about Jesus had circulated around the Christian community. People all over the world had already heard about Jesus and his sacrifice. This is about 85 years after his death on the cross. At this time, Matthew, Mark, um, and Luke had already penned many of the stories about Jesus that happened. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are titled and must and mostly known as the synoptic gospels. Now, the word synoptic is an indication that means to see things together. In other words, these three books are the books of the gospels that are very similar in nature. They contain many of the same stories and teachings, but are told from different angles. Yet, you need to understand this, while each book is written by different authors and have very similar stories. Every author that wrote these books was inspired by the Lord. Unlike these books, John, in penning the Gospel of John, he did not include the nativity scene that we see in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. In these books, it usually start off talking about Jesus and Jesus' birth in Bethlehem. And one thing I love about John is that he goes back even further into history. While these three Gospels portray Jesus as a king, as the servant, and the son of man, John intentionally portrays Jesus as the son of God. John states his purpose more clearly than any of the authors in the Synoptic Gospels. He goes past the initial birth of Jesus here on earth, but he takes us back all the way back to the creation of the world and how Jesus was a part of God's initial plan from the very beginning. If you ever read the Bible in chronological order, um, John 1.1 is the beginning of the chronological Bible because John takes us before the creation of the world. In penning John, John 20.31, John reveals his purpose for us reading the book of John and him writing it and being inspired by the Lord. So this purpose is not a purpose that's written by John and the readers of John, but this purpose will be the essence of why we are studying the gospel of John. And it is my prayer that this purpose is fulfilled. In John 20, 31, John writes this, he says, but these things are written to you. I'm going to say this to you. This sermon series, the gospel of John, is written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Very powerful statement. The goal 
in this message is to give you all of the knowledge and wisdom you need to understand that Jesus truly is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that you, by believing, you may have life in his name. So many people don't follow Jesus or understand Jesus or come to Christ not because they don't want to, because they don't understand why he truly is the Messiah. When John wrote this book, he wrote this book so that believers can believe in Jesus Christ one, not only believe in him, but know without a benefit of the doubt that Jesus truly is the son of God so that they can have life in his name. Now, you may be saying, Pastor, I'm already a believer. I'm already saved. I believe in Jesus Christ. But this is what I truly believe. If we know more about Jesus, not just know of Jesus, but we grow in the knowledge of Jesus, not only will we be saved, but we will be more impactful and effectual here on this earth because our hearts, our minds will grow deeper and closer to Jesus as a being. Jesus just won't be some mystical figure of the past or somebody that did something that's in heaven with our Father, with Father God, but he will be someone that comes alive in our lives. To accomplish the goal we're accomplishing today, and I hope to accomplish, John is very intentional in presenting a distinctive picture of Jesus Christ. It's not that it's different from the other Gospels because it is one in unity as the portraits in the other three Gospels, but it is one that adds significantly to our faith and to our belief that Jesus is truly the Son of God. Yes, John's gospel is different. One of the reasons I love to read the book of John, while the other gospels talk about Jesus and his words, you have the Sermon on the Mount and the red words that Jesus actually said in the Bible, John points us to who Jesus is. You hear things like Jesus is um, the great shepherd. Jesus makes some very powerful statements that I want us to examine here in this series. John, if you know anything about John, he was one of the closest disciples out of the 12 that actually walked with Jesus. He was in Jesus' inner circle. While Jesus had 12 disciples, John and Peter were his left and right hand man. Every other disciple in the Bible lived a martyr's death, and they were beheaded, they were stoned, they were hung, except John. John is the author who actually um, wrote Revelations. He was exiled to Patmos, where God spoke to him and gave him a vision of what was and what is to come in the life of the believer in the new heavens and the new earth. John also called himself the beloved disciples that Jesus loved. Now, I'm not saying he's conceited, but it can see he's a little bit prideful because he walked so close to Jesus, closer than almost any disciple. So what better book for us to read and examine than reading the book of John, someone that was considered to be the best friend of Jesus. In these 21 blessed chapters, John unfolds his divine character. Yes, he is God, but there's a divinity that some of us don't understand and don't know. And my goal is to help you see that Jesus is divine in nature. So over the next couple of weeks, my goal is to preach through um, the book of John. I'm not sure how long or how many weeks we're going to spend in this particular book. But it is my prayer that as we journey through the book of John, that we, we are able to get a clear portrait of who Jesus truly is. So today, I titled today's message, Jesus, the Word of God, a study on John 1, verses 1 to 18. We're going to start in the very beginning. Again, I said it before, we're going to journey through this book and hopefully get to the end, provide clarity. But for today's sake, we're going to start in John 1, 1, verse 18. Let me go ahead and pray for us before we jump into God's work. Oh, heavenly gracious God, I pray that the words that are on the page penned by John speak to us. Father, Lord, speak. Speak to us in a dynamic way. Right now, open up our hearts and minds to hear you and see you, and let your word come alive to us in a dynamic way. Father, I pray right now that I decrease and you increase, that this flesh gets no glory, that all the glory is given to you. I pray that your name 
and that you alone are magnified and your saints are edified through this word that is spoken through me as a vessel. You alone, God, please, Jesus, get all the glory today. In Jesus' name, amen. In John 1, it simply starts off by telling us the word became flesh. And this is what it reads. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory as the Holy One. In this opening chapter, John paints a picture of Jesus. He says that Jesus is the word of God, and this is the word that we want to focus on this morning. I want to start off by us understanding that Jesus is the pre-existing word of God. John tells us in this scripture that any beginning was the word. John intentionally invokes the language that we see in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning. John is making a direct link between the nature of God and the nature of the word Jesus Christ. The word that we see in Greek is, is, is logos, and this is God's living word. So when he calls Jesus the word, what well, he is telling us that the word that Jesus actually spoke, the word that we read in the Old Testament, the word that we read on the pages is Jesus and Jesus alone. Every word, every chapter, every scripture points to Jesus. When you read the Old Testament, every prophecy written in the Old Testament, Jesus fulfilled. Jesus is the embodiment of God's holy word. That's why when Jesus came in the previous books of Matthew, Mark, and the book of Luke, he writes, I did not come to abolish the law, but I came to what? Fulfill the law. He is the fulfillment of the word. He is the fulfillment of the commandments. In fact, Jesus is the only one able to keep the Ten Commandments. Paul is clear in other parts of the Bible that the laws of the Bible, the Ten Commandments, was never meant for men to follow, but the commandments were meant to be a mirror to men to show them their inadequacies and their failures in their lives. In other words, their sin. We can't keep the law. The law was written to show men that we are in need of a Savior, and that Savior is Jesus Christ. That's why John says he is the living word, Logos. Jesus is our constant word. According to this verse, what John is revealing to us is that Jesus has always existed. I said it earlier that these words in the beginning are identical to the Old Testament word in the beginning that we... Right? So when reading this, this is not an accident. This is not an accident because the first thing God is going to tell us today is that Jesus created the universe. That's why he says this. I want you to hear this. John writes in pens that all things were made through him and without him was nothing made that was made. First, before anything in this world was made, Jesus has always existed. He did not come into being in Bethlehem, but he's been here throughout the ages of time. 
So when we read, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, what this is saying is that Jesus was here before any created matter. Before there was man, before there was trees, before there was animals, before there was me and you, before there was, war, before there was anything on this earth, when, when, when the earth was formed, um, when the earth was void and dark, Jesus was there. Jesus has always existed. There has never been a time where Jesus did not exist. Many other biblical authors also echoes this sentiment that Jesus has always pre-existed in nature. Jude writes this way. He says, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, and dominion, and authority. Amen. Before all time and now and forever. Jude says this. Timothy says this. For God so for God saved us and called us to live a, a holy life. He did this not because we deserved it, but because that was his plan from the beginning of time to show us his grace through Jesus Christ. Not only is Jesus the pre-existing word and a constant word, but Jesus is the communion word. This phrase commune means and signifies that Jesus has always had communion with the Father. He has always existed with God the Father and Jesus the Son, and currently he's presently in the heavenly places with God on his right side. In these verses, it reveals something called the Trinity. The Trinity. It is almost, let me say this to you, it is almost impossible to fully understand this um, passage outside of understanding the deity of Jesus through the Trinity. All right? So that's why I put this up here to give us more of a clear understanding of this term called the Trinity for those who really don't understand what this means for the believer. According to theologians, now, the word Trinity is not a word that's actually in the Bible. Let me say that. There is not, there is not a word in the Bible that says Trinity. But when you read Scripture, when you read in the beginning was the word, the word was God, the word was with God, that Scripture alone tells us that they are one. It says that he is God. He was with God, and he is what? God. If he is God and he's with God, it means that, one, he is God. If he was with God, it says that he is not the Father, God the Father. So when the word says he was with God, it's referring to God the Father. When it says he is God, it's referring to him being God in his divinity. So what you see in this picture is a clear um, description of what that scripture actually says, okay? You have the Father, you have the Holy Spirit, and you have the Son. They have always existed in nature, okay? When you read this story in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it wasn't like, oh, Jesus finally existed. God gave birth to a son, and there he was. No. You see? And that's why the Bible goes on to say the word became what? Flesh and dwelt among us. So the word has always existed preexistently, right? But it became flesh. It didn't say the word came alive or Jesus was finally born. No. Jesus has always existed, but he became flesh in nature. See, there was a spiritual component where Jesus has always existed, but that spiritual component put on the flesh of man, which I'll be talking about in a moment. So therefore, when we see Jesus, we see God. He's not God the Father. That's why throughout scriptures, he prays to God. You see, if God the Father and Jesus the Son, if God the Father became Jesus the Son and they were the same, Jesus would have prayed to his Father. You get what I'm saying? It would have been very crazy if Jesus was like, okay, I'm praying to the Father, but I am the Father, but let me pray to the Father. So he's praying to himself. No, he's praying to the Father because at that moment, he was no longer in the heavenly realm with God the Father like he always was since the beginning of time. In that moment, he came to earth, and he put on a human body, the human flesh. The one time that we see the Trinity together is in the beginning of the Gospels when Jesus 
was baptized, and the, and the Father from heaven spoke, this is my son who I am well pleased of, right? Then the Holy Spirit said, came down like a dove and came down upon him. It's the one time we see the Trinity together in the New Testament. Other than that, we see him in dispensations. We see God the Father in the Old Testament. We see Jesus moving in the New Testament and the Gospels. Then we see Jesus when he says, I must go to the Father so that who may come? The Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit comes after Jesus departs. The disciples said, Jesus, why must you go? Jesus says, I must go so that the Holy Spirit can come. So when Jesus was here on this world, in this world, walking in the flesh, the Holy Spirit and God the Father was still in the heavenly realms. Now that Jesus is gone, who's here now? The Holy Spirit. So right now, the Holy Spirit that's in me is in you. And the Holy Spirit is, was here for us to keep us until who comes again? Jesus. The next time we see Jesus, we're going to see Jesus, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and God together on a new earth, reigning together in the heavenly kingdom. Amen, somebody. Amen, somebody. Maranatha, Maranatha. That means what? Jesus come. Jesus come again. So the Trinity comes from the word that means tri, meaning three, and unity, meaning one. Again, this word is not in the Bible. So in order to better understand that, theologians and, and, and disciples and bishops and church fathers have created this word called the Trinity, saying God is three distinct individuals, God the Father, God the Son, and Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, but one true, true God. They're one true God. Now, so many times in Scripture we see this from the beginning of Genesis that the Trinity is a real thing. The Trinity is a thing. In Genesis, when God was created everything, I'm talking about the Godhead, it says, and God said, let what? Us means one person or two. More than one. It could be two or three, right? So why would God in Genesis write, let us? If he was just one plural person. If God the Father and God the Son was one person, one person, why would he write us? Well, I mean, excuse me. Why would he inspire Moses to write us in Scripture? While Moses never um, identified the Godhead as three people, God inspired him to write, let us make man in whose image? Our is what? One or two people. More than one in our image. You see, if God was one person, it'd say, it'd say, and God said, let me make man in my image after my likeness. He didn't say that. He says, before the end of time, before God made anything, before God made man, before God made earth, before God made anything, he says, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish and the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle. Isn't that mind-blowing? Does anyone else see the Trinity in that scripture, or is it just me? Is, is it just me? No, no, right? I, I, I mean, help me, under, help, help me help us. If I'm wrong, please tell me I'm wrong. Because when I read this, I see us are in scripture. It goes on to say in Paul, in Colossians, he says, who is the image of the invisible God? Who is the image? Well, Paul is saying, who is the image? He's asking, who is the image of the invisible God? The firstborn of every creature, of, of every creation. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by who? By him, Jesus. Jesus created everything. So it wasn't like Jesus just stepped on the scene and was like, oh, it's Jesus. No, he's always been here. He created everything with God. They co-labored to create everything and by him and for him was everything created. And he is before what? All things. And by him, all things consist. This is a biblical thing. I can't make this stuff up. So what I'm saying is, if you take this out of Scripture and you just say, I don't believe in the Trinity, I don't believe in, in Jesus, I just believe in God the Father, something is wrong. Listen to this. If you, if you read the Torah, the Torah says us and our. So if you read the Torah, 
Torah, you're going to have to explain to me what us and our truly means. You, you, have to, you have to make an argument and say that us and ours is a single person. And if that argument is a valid argument, then I will say you're right. But if you can't make us and our a single person in English, in the English language, the Hebrew language, the Greek language, the Spanish language, the Creole language, us and our always means more than one. So in other words, this is a biblical statement. You cannot believe in any part of the Bible without believing in the Trinity. You cannot believe in the Trinity without believing in Jesus. You cannot believe in Jesus without believing Jesus is the Word. You cannot believe Jesus is the Word without understanding that Jesus fulfilled every prophecy in the Word. You cannot believe Jesus fulfilled every prophecy in the world word without understanding that Jesus is who God prophesied about, and Jesus has been here since the beginning. Amen, church. Since the beginning, we cannot say that Colossians is clear and tells us that Jesus is the creative word. He was the energy before the creation of the universe. He spoke it, and it was done. Nothing existed before Jesus. Not only is Jesus the pre-existing word, but Jesus is also the personalized word. The Bible says, when I say personalized, I'm referring to the person of Jesus in the bodily form. It says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. We have seen the glory of God in his work, in his son, Jesus. Glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Grace can only come through Jesus. And nothing else. Grace cannot come through the sacrifice of an animal. The blood of an animal is not enough to forgive one of your sins. Grace comes through Jesus. That's why the Bible says he is the way, the truth, and the what? Life. He gives life. He takes life. He gives Zoe. The word Zoe in Greek means what? Eternal life. I said it last week. Come on. We're not, we sleep. No, I'm messing. It's okay. Zoe means eternal life. So Jesus is Zoe. Now, this verse is the clearest indication of the incarnation of Jesus. This verse tells us that Jesus didn't only come from Mary in Bethlehem. It says, he became flesh, then he dwelt among us. This is the bodily manifestation of a supernatural divine being. While I can honestly say that his incarnation is a mystery to us, how did Jesus become a man? This answer, if you ask me this question, only lies in the mind of God himself. But one thing I do know is that God chose a virgin named Mary and caused her to miraculously conceive a baby and give forth birth to baby Jesus in Bethlehem. I don't know that on that night how Jesus was born, but one thing I do know is this. The Word became flesh. The Word became flesh. While Jesus existed from all eternity's past, he took upon himself and put on flesh there in Bethlehem, in which we see in the book of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John takes us back and tells us not only was he born on that day in Bethlehem, but he has always existed. The creator became the creation. God placed his life in the hands of mortals, and God dwelt among us, dwelt among us. That statement alone is so rich in, in, in history, so rich in divinity, because listen to this. Jesus literally pitched a tent among mortals. Paul tells us this body is a tent, right? It's constantly decaying. This is a tent. This is a temporary possession for an internal being. 
You are eternal in nature. Now, while you haven't always existed before time with Jesus, now and forever, you will always exist. When this body has decayed and you get old and God calls you home, the Christian, the believer, will only go one place. That's heaven. And those that don't believe, which is one of the biggest tragedies in the world, will go to a place of outer darkness. Jesus pitched his tent here. He lived among us. He worked among us. He prayed among us. He suffered among us. And he died among us. God walked on this earth, and he was unrecognized by many who came in close contact with him. That's why in that scripture, John um, intentionally points out that he was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not what? Know him. The world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. What he's referring to in this scripture is God's chosen people, the Jews, the Jewish people. He came to them because when Jesus came, his ministry was targeted to who? The Jews. It wasn't to the Gentiles. It was to the Jews. Because many times in the Bible, he says the Jews would be first, and the Gentiles would be last. Now, Paul tells us in Romans that because the Jews did not accept him, God extended the right hand of fellowship to the Gentiles to become children of God. Now, I'm not saying that the children of God isn't the Jewish people, but what Scripture did tell us in the beginning, I want to take us back there, but as a matter of fact, I'm going to take us back there. He says this, the light, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming to the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not what? Receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become what? That's what the word says. So children of God is not only a designation for Jewish people. Children of God is a designation for all people that believe in him. Paul said that the old circumcision was a matter of the flesh. The Jewish people circumcised became children of God. But the new circumcision, the new covenant, is not a matter of the flesh, but a matter of what? Circumcision of the what? Heart. So now it's no longer a flesh thing. It's a heart thing. So therefore, the circumcision of the flesh is not enough to get you into heaven. While the circumcision of the flesh, if you do that, great. It's ritualistic in nature. But the real circumcision... Today isn't of the flesh, but it is of the heart. That's why Paul makes it very clear throughout Scripture. That's why John makes it very clear throughout Scripture that the circumcision of the heart is what makes us children of God. It says, who were born not of what? Blood, Jewish faith, or the will of God. God's will was for the Jewish people to inherit um, eternal life through Jesus, the Messiah, because he is the Messiah, but of who? Of God. So the way God used, the avenue God used to, to make people children of God was through his son, Jesus Christ. The Bible says he was in the world, and the world did not know him. He came to his own. Listen, the biggest tragedy today is men and women that fail to know Jesus. That's the biggest tragedy. The biggest tragedy isn't the, the war in Ukraine. The biggest tragedy isn't world hunger. The biggest tragedy in the world today is men and women not knowing Jesus as the Messiah and their personal Lord and Savior. Because it's only through the acknowledgement of Jesus and the belief of Jesus can one be saved. That's why he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, no one no one gets to the Father but through me. This is a statement made by Jesus himself. He says, no one has seen the Father but me. In other words, when Jesus says no one has seen the Father, he's referring to his preexistence before him putting on the bodily flesh of mankind. If you read the Old Testament, whenever a Moses or anyone um, saw Jesus, God, they had to do what? Cover their eyes. Because the glory of the God was, was so bright that it would kill them. In fact, Moses spent time with God 
up on, up on the mountain when he came down and said his face was what? Shiny. It was bright because the glory of God was so bright. Not, not that he's seen God himself because you can't see God, but the glory of God was so bright. He was so close to God that his face shined bright. In other words, God was saying, I am, Jesus was saying, I'm the only one that's seen God the Father. And what you're seeing is God the Father, God, the embodiment of God, not God the Father, God in the flesh. That's what he says. So scripture says he came to his own and they rejected him. The world today still rejects Jesus. While there's so much information about Jesus, while historically you can research Jesus and what he's done and it's been written by many people, the world still rejects Jesus. You see, history is history. And how do history become history? Listen to this. When more than three people agree on one thing or one, one act, it becomes what? History. So if a person goes outside and they come in and one person comes and says, hey, I just seen a major accident outside. Two cars crashed and hit each other. And I'm like, oh, really? Do I believe it? Uh, maybe, maybe not. But if two people come and tell me the same thing, then what? It becomes what? True. If three people tell me, it becomes what? Even more true. If 10 people tell me, it becomes what? Fact. Right? And it's the same way with the Bible. Not only did one person see and witness the life of Jesus, you have 12 men that gave their lives for this cause and for this man, Jesus, the Son of God. Not would one man die for Jesus, but 12 men died for something because they knew something that many of us fail to know and see that Jesus is the Messiah and he is the living word that the Old Testament writers prophesied about in Scripture. In Scripture, it even said that over a hundred people in the book of Acts saw Jesus ascend into heaven. This is a real theme. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the proclaimed word. Jesus is the proclaimed word. The Bible says this in John 1. It says, for from his fullness we have all received, me, you, the world, we have all received grace upon grace through Jesus. Now, while Jesus died for everyone, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, he loved the what? The world. But, but here's the but, but whosoever believe in him shall have eternal life. So while the fullness of God was for everyone in the world, only those that believe received this grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through who? Jesus. So listen to this. The law was given through who? Moses. But it didn't say the grace and truth came through the sacraments. It didn't say that. It didn't say the grace and truth came from the sacrifices of the priest. It says that the grace, grace is God's unmerited favor, on a believer, God, forgiveness of sin, that's his grace, the grace of God upon your life, his grace, was given through Jesus Christ. No other way. No one has ever seen God. Remember, I just said that, right? No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. You ready for this statement? The Word was God. The Word is God. The word became flesh. One of the marks of this gospel is the weightiest doctrines delivered in simplest forms and simple words. The word who became flesh and dwelt among us, Jesus Christ, was, past tense, and is God. Many sects have made Jesus to be a prophet, has made him to be a great teacher. Some Jewish scholars call him Rabbi, as in, listen, would you call a man that calls himself God a prophet? No. Would you call him a rabbi? Either Jesus is two things. Either he is God or he's a lunatic. You pick. Because you can't tell me, oh, this man that claims to be God, oh, he's a great prophet. No, he's a lunatic if he's not God. Any man that walks, listen, how about if I walk on stage one day and I tell you guys, hey, 
I'm God. I'm God. There's, 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 Chris said, I'm delusional, right? I'm delusional. Listen, God the Father, the Holy Spirit, and Barnabas the Son. Right here. I'm a lunatic. I'm not a prophet. I'm not a rabbi. You should take and make sure I am exiled from this community if I tell you I'm God. And I don't get this. There, here's a man that's saying he is God. Scripture points to him as being God, but yet and still so many religious sects, sects want to say, oh, we'll keep it modest. We know that he did the miracles. We saw the miracles. We believe in the miracles. We believe in his teachings. His teachings are profound and powerful, but we really can't accept that he's the Messiah. You see, any man that's able to do the miracles that Jesus did, turn water into wine, heal the sick, give the blind sight, feed 5,000 people from a bread, a bread and a fish, feed 3,000 people, walk on water, raise the dead, control the winds and the waters and the storms till the storms to cease and it actually stops. Let me try that one day because I hate driving in the rain. Can you imagine if I get in my car and I'm like, rain, stop, and it just stops? I command you to stop. I command this plant to die, and it dies. That's a, can you imagine that? But Jesus did that. But they say, oh, yeah, he did all of that, but he's not the Messiah. He did all of that, but he's not God. He's just some man with supernatural powers. You show me a man that can stop the weather, a man that can make a plant God by speaking to it, a man that can heal the sick, a man that can make the blind see, a man that can turn a loaf and a fish to five feet, 5,000 loaves, and have some leftover. Come on, somebody, right? Leftovers. Jesus, that was the first leftovers we see in the world, leftovers, right? Put that in the fridge for, for, right, for you. Like, show me a man that can do that, and I'll stop believing in Jesus as the Messiah. And I'm not even talking about the fulfillment of the prophecies, okay? I'm not even going there. I'm just saying the miracles that every religion acknowledge, if you could just show me that in a man, I'll stop believing in Jesus. I will never preach another sermon. You will never see, if anyone on channel 95, anyone here could show me a man that could do what Jesus did, die, raise himself up in three days, and ascend into heaven, please, listen, I will stop believing. I will give up my pastor card and my ordination, because it will never happen. It cannot happen. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is who the Old Testament prophesied about thousands of thousands of years ago. He is the embodiment of God himself in the flesh. We must understand that, and that's why we see in John 10, 10 when he says, that the Jewish, it says, it's the Jewish believers comes to Jesus and says, it is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for the blasphemy because you are being a man and you're making yourself like God. The Jewish and the, and, and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were upset because Jesus was saying he was God. They said, I'm not going to stone you for your good works. See, they were okay with the good works. They were okay when Jesus was healing, but they were upset when Jesus said, that these works that I am doing is a product of me being God in the flesh. They couldn't take that. You know, give me the works of Jesus, but don't give me his divinity. They're okay with that, but they're not okay with him being God. We cry out as Christians, that's not blasphemy, but Jesus is our Lord and our Savior. I hope you see what this means for our series in the book of John over the next couple of weeks. It means that we will not just see Jesus as some man who embodied the flesh, but we will see him as God. Jesus came to reveal to us that he is God in the flesh. He did this in two primary ways. Jesus proclaimed the word by telling us he came to proclaim the light. He came to a world that was in spiritual darkness and opened the curtains of grace, revealing the truth to God's men that were wandering in this darkness. Jesus came to illuminate the pathway to God. He came to tell us and show us that he truly is the way, the truth, and the light. And this light will cause men to do two things. Either men, in acknowledging Jesus as the Messiah, 
or Jesus as some prophet will cause them to do two things. Either it will cause them to believe and repent of their sins and open their arms to the Lord, or it will cause them to reject the light and continue in darkness. One will lead to salvation, and the other will lead to damnation. My goal today in this series is that no one, that no one, that no one that hears this message on Channel 95, no one that hears this message on YouTube, no one that hears this message on Facebook or Instagram is damned to internal darkness, but they are able to see the light and experience that thing we call Zoe, eternal life. Thank God that he has given us light for fallen man. Now we don't have to be bound by the law because Jesus is the what? The embodiment of the law. We can now live by grace. We don't have to try our hardest to obey every commandment because we can't do it. The rich young ruler came to Jesus. I obeyed all commandments. Jesus says, you may not sin in action, but you sin in your heart and your mind. We cannot keep the law. Thank God for Jesus because we're not bound by the law. We are now able to walk in grace. That's an amen moment. Amen, church. The grace of God can now be accessed by you and I here on earth. Through Jesus and his sacrifice. And lastly, in closing, not only has Jesus came to proclaim light, Jesus have came, come to proclaim life. Jesus came to his people and who had his word and were living in the promised land for many years. He came to the Jewish faith, and then he came to the Gentile, and he came to tell them that there is a way that we can experience God the Father and experience eternal life. This must be one of the saddest things in the world and biggest tragedies that people will experience eternal damnation because they reject Jesus as the Messiah, as God, as the Son of God here on earth. I won't spend too much arguing why Jesus is God, but I will say this. Jesus fulfilled every prophecy in the Old Testament. He is the fulfillment of the law. Every disciple died for him because they understood the truth. Over 100 people testified to his resurrection and his ascension. He is the most talked about and documented man in the world. At this given moment, over a million people is praying to him. Even on Sundays, I will, I will bump that number up to maybe a billion people are praying to him right now as we speak. And the most important thing to understand, Jesus is a Messiah because he himself said out of his mouth that he is God. I want a statement, a, a straightforward statement to stand in your heart and mind as we close today. And the statement is simply this. I need you to hear this. If you don't hear anything else, that the word Jesus Christ was with God and he was God and he is God. And he desires for you to have a relationship with God through him. He is God. And he is the image of God, perfectly, perfectly reflecting all that God is and standing forth from all eternity as the fullness and the deity of God, of the Godhead in the flesh that now sits at the right hand of the Father and we experience through the Holy Spirit. Jesus, the God-man, has died for your sins and we can place our confidence in him because he is divine in nature and he is the son of God. He is God. His sacrifice on the cross has eternal implications. And today, my prayer is that you accept Jesus as the Messiah and your Lord and personal Savior. The final question today is simply this. Do you believe that Jesus is Lord? If you do believe that Jesus is Lord, and if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, the Bible says you shall be saved and you shall have eternal life. Let me pray for us this morning. Oh, heavenly gracious Father, I thank you for the opportunity to come into your holy sanctuary. I pray that as we go and voyage through the book of John, that you alone, Jesus, come alive in our hearts and our minds and that we acknowledge you to be who you say you are the Son of God, the Messiah that has come to save us from our sins. I pray today that just one, if more than one, have accepted you and see you, praise God. But Lord, I pray that just one today 
come to realize that you truly are who you say you are and that Jesus, you alone, can save them from the wickedness and darkness of this world. Father, I pray that you be with us this week, that you guide us and protect us and that you cover us and fill us with the Holy Spirit and let your power be felt. And I pray that all that we do bring you glory. Forgive us for our sins, for our sins are many before you, but your blood alone, your blood alone, has covered all of our sins, a multitude of our sins, past, present, and future. And Lord, right now, we thank you. We thank you for that. So be with us. We pray that now as we leave your, this place, that we never leave your presence, that your presence go before us and behind us, wherever we may go. We ask this right now in the name of God, the Father, Jesus, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let all God's people say, amen. God bless you. Thank you for coming. I pray that the, today's word encourage you and enrich your walk with him. It is my prayer that his countenance shine upon you and keep you in his word as you voyage throughout the week. Um, be advised that this Tuesday is Bible study in Willowbrook, Crud, and OBT. If you want to join us, you can. And Bible study will be this Thursday here and broadcasted on Channel 95 at 1 o'clock this Thursday. God bless you. I love you all. See you guys next week.